I like to think of myself as a creative, period. And what I mean by that is a person that um, has a creative mind. And I like to think of myself as a, I say, uh, a person that has impact on society, which basically that's an artist's basic place in society. That's what we do. We are the recorders and the documentationers of culture. I have formal training, but I've been doing this since I was like four or five. How I started when I was very young, I used to, we couldn't afford crayons and pencils, so I used to um, cut out, tear up the newspapers and make my little people and little farms and stuff like that and paste it onto those, stick them on the paper and stuff. So that's how I really got started. And then as I got into elementary, I got introduced to crayons and um, temper paint. And then um, when I went there, I went to junior high school and I was kind of lucky in that I had this wonderful art teacher. His name was Dr. Pat Nagel Frenchman. And he took notice and I, I did it my first collage. And um, he entered it in a contest and I won. And then he encouraged my mother to uh, put me into art classes and stuff. So then that's where it kind of took off because I got more formal training like that. And then um, at that time we lived in Brooklyn. We lived right across like two blocks from Pratt Institute, which is a big art school. And um, I remember growing up and I used to see the students going in with their big portfolios and stuff. And, um, me and my best friend were sneaking to the gym. And uh, one day we were playing and the, and the basketball coach saw me playing and he offered me a scholarship. That's not my real formal formal training because I, I then went to Pratt. And I attended Pratt for two years. And um, at, that was in 1968. A lot of stuff happened, the riots, and Dr. King got fascinated. I got very frustrated because I never saw any black artists. You know, um, I lived in a black community and I didn't know, you know, I took an art history course. That's what really set it off. I took an art history course, and I don't know if you know the, the big textbook for art history. And in the back of the book, they had where the black artists were, or they called primitive, but everything else was Western culture. And I got kind of frustrated, and, um, and I really, we had a really good team, but I just wasn't getting what I wanted to do with my art. So then I transferred to Fisk University, which was the best thing I ever did because it was a HBCU. But at that time, David Driscoll was a department chair and he was connected with everybody that was important in black art or African-American art. And Dr. Driscoll really opened my eyes, not only just to art as a, from a black perspective, but how to, to survive. That was the biggest thing I got from that, is how to survive as an artist. The long and the short of it is, I live to paint and I paint to live. I think if that was taken from me, I don't, I, I, I shudder to think if I couldn't do it. And that's been that forever since I was a kid. You know, I used to draw, 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 but I just, can't see not doing it. Uh, I'm happy to see this happen. I can say that I came here in 1977 and I can remember my dear friend Paul Youngblood. He was probably one of the most greatest artists that ever come out of St. Croix. And he would come and get me, and we would sit right outside the dock there, just me and him, with our paintings. 
hoping that a cruise ship, that was so dumb, that a cruise ship would come and people would buy our art, which never really happened. And um, it really wasn't that much going on. You had a few artists like Toby Shoyer and um, Leo Cardi. Um, but artistically, this shows the growth of the artist community on St. Croix. So I feel really good with that. And as far as um, I can remember Candia Atwater, the founder, she approached me with the idea to do an art museum. So she would rent a room at Carambola and she had a vision of the, um, the Caribbean Museum. And we would, it was just me and two other artists and we would do exhibits maybe for two or three years. And uh, finally, she got someone to donate, help donate and get this building. And I've watched it grow. And as the building grew, the artist community has grown. But St. Croix has always had really good artists here, like Dove, Ansem, Richards, uh, like I mentioned, Toby um, Sawyer, Leo Cardi, Marcia Jameson. And we would just, have little shows all around the island, like at Carvalho K or, um, you know, wherever we could exhibit. Like I said, I'm very, right now I'm in a phase where I'm very interested and I feel like we're at a point where we're at our survival. We look at what's going on in the world as it applies to um, people. And one of the things that made me do these pieces, if you think about, um, again, women, and um, George Floyd, or the recent young man um, in Memphis, the last words were, they called for their mother. Which to me was like, wow. You know, the significance of their mother, their experience between their mother. So it's telling me like these people were like eons apart. One was in Memphis, one was in uh, Milwaukee. But that connection between their mom and how they felt, their last words. And I know my relationship with my mother, I wouldn't be here now if it wasn't for my mother. And um, so right now I'm just trying to examine the significance of womanhood, basically, and particularly in the Caribbean, because I think the Caribbean woman is so um, underrated. You know, you go to different agencies or um, businesses, it's usually a woman playing a significant role. But we never hear them getting the credit that they do. Most teachers on St. Croix are women. Most teachers in the States are women. But we don't get the, they don't get the pay or the credit that they do. Okay, this painting reflects, um, again, women, but the bambula dancers. I feel that they're very spiritual. I feel that they're very significant in our history on St. Croix. I think some of the best bambula culture is right on St. Croix. I don't think one is better than another, but we really focus on showcasing it. And in this piece, they're fleeing to the Jordan River. And that comes from my dad, who always used to tell me when I was growing up, we didn't get like beat and stuff like that, but my dad was a lay minister and he would always give us these Bible parables. And one that used to scare the mess out of me was when I get to the Jordan River, when I die, if, I t if I've told a lie, like if you think I'm telling a lie, he said, John, you're not going to cross that river. You're just going to drown. And I think that um, these are spirits or women racing to the Jordan, but not everybody's going to cross. And that's what that piece kind of implies. My biggest lows was, I, I was just telling my daughter, um, when I left college, when I graduated college, I was like the big man on campus, artistically speaking. And um, 
you know, so I had already went to Pratt and everything. I was very familiar with the New York scene. So I went back to New York and I, I had a loft in Tribeca and I was doing very well. And then New York went through a, went bankrupt. They all thought it was teachers. So I lost my job, which I couldn't believe because I was very content in it. And, um, I had this, I had a lot, not gonna say I had a lot of girlfriends, but I had a lot of friends, okay? And with the partying and I had my building and all this and my work was selling. And then everything just dried up like boom. I mean, I couldn't believe it, it happened so fast. And um, I was broke. It was one of the coldest winters in New York. It was so cold in my building that when I, my nose would run and, the, and the, 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 the liquid would turn into um, icicles. That's how cold it was. And um, I couldn't believe it, man. And then my wife, she wasn't my wife at the time, and um, I was dating her. And she said, man, I'm going to the Virgin Islands. And, um, you know, I'm a New Yorker now, like, uh, I'm, you know, I'm like, I'm thinking that I'm gonna climb back up because all my artist friends and stuff, they were in New York and, and uh, they, and I came down here to visit her for Christmas. And I couldn't believe it. I had never been in the Caribbean, man. I saw the water, I couldn't even believe the water was so clear and the people were so nice and everything. And I said, man, I ain't going back. And I ain't went back then. I go back to visit my parents, but I, I can't see myself even when I go up, you know, I go up every now and then for medical and stuff like that, but I just can't envision. I, I to me, I, I pinch it. I look when I go up, I ask people, how do you live like this? This was it. This was like probably to me the best thing since sliced bread. It was like, the people were nice. I loved my students at school. Um, this was it. So my low turned into a high. If I had I not got laid off and everything, I probably would have never left.